Well, again, it's a, a joy to be with you once more as we uh, continue our survey of types of tyranny uh, that may uh, threaten uh, the church and, uh, and God's people. And today we'll be getting into it. So uh, once again, to recap, you know, we had a, a, a brief opening discussion of Christians and the state particularly looking at Paul's disposition towards the Roman Empire in the Book of Romans. And we said, look, you know, Paul was not a political activist. He was a primarily a follower of Jesus, trying to proclaim the, the, the gospel of the Lord Jesus to Jews and Gentiles throughout the Eastern Mediterranean. But he did believe that there was going to be an inevitable col uh, collusion between the claims of Christ and the claims of Caesar. Uh, a collusion, uh, or a collision, I should say, that would be uh, remedied in the final assize when uh, Christ would be revealed as Lord of all. And then in the second lecture, we, we, we looked kind of a bit at Romans 13 about submission to governing authorities, and then we want to know about the exception. Uh, when is it okay to disobey? And this is something that people have wrestled with through a lot of history, particularly you know, during the uh, the British Civil War, with the execution of the King, the American War of Independence, uh, the uh, American Civil War, as well, and in many other places around the world. When do we submit to governing authorities, and when do we resist them? And then we also discussed briefly how we might resist them. Uh, when should we engage in civil disobedience, and there is, is there even uh, an ethical justification sometimes for uncivil disobedience? Uh, today I'm going to look at the types of groups, uh, the sort of authoritarian groups we may want to consist, uh, consider, consider resisting in the present, but we have to do that principally by looking at the past. Uh, one of the best books I've, um, I've read in recent years is by a, uh, a historian called Timothy Snyder. Now, he's an expert on the Second World War, particularly on the land of Ukraine. He wrote a book called Bloodlands that shows how uh, Ukraine and you know, Lithuania, Latvia, and, and, and that, that whole Eastern European theater was really decimated uh, by both the Nazis and the Soviets. And the Bloodlands is an, is an appropriate term for the horrific war crimes and terrible deeds that were done to the inhabitants of that region. But he also did a very good little book called On Tyranny. I mean, it's almost like a pamphlet. And, and I would, I very rarely commend uh, people's books beyond my own. I, um, you know, uh, I tell people, you know, buying my own books, buying, buying my books is my love language. Um, <laughs> but before you read any of mine, uh, I would ask you to either purchase his book On Tyranny. It's only like, like five or six dollars or get down the audio book. It's more like a pamphlet. It's, it's like an extended pamphlet. It's a good little read. It's about, you know, if you've got a two-hour drive somewhere, you can listen to it on the, on the drive to where you're going. It's called On Tyranny. And it's, uh, it's a great warning about how easily a free country can be uh, put under the yoke of an authoritarian regime. And the good thing about it, he doesn't just warn about right-wing uh, authoritarians. He also warns of left-wing uh, authoritarians, as exemplified by the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. So that that's a book I would contend. And I think we have to think uh, we have to acknowledge that when we think of authoritarianism, we do have some very good examples from the 20th century in both uh, Nazism and the communism, as particularly found in the Soviet Union. Now, we all know the Nazis. Na na Nazis are, are, the, are the quintessential background. Everyone you hate at some point gets called a Nazi. You know, uh, you know every, every, I mean, the term Nazi is, is now used uh, so freely, it becomes practically meaning, meaningless. You know, it basically means bad people or people I don't like. Uh, Tom Holland, not, not Spider-Man, the, um, the British historian, um, he, he, has a, he has an interesting uh, proposal. He argues that Nazis have eclipsed uh, Satan as the ultimate symbol of evil in Western civilization. So the Nazis have, uh, have re literally replaced Satan when we think of the ultimate form of evil. So, so and I think that rings true. You know, we, we, we think of them as the ultimate evil. Uh, I mean, and this is despite the fact that you could argue that um, you know, between Stalin and Mao, they possibly killed far more people than the, the uh, German regime uh, ever did.
But here's the thing, when it comes to, to, to Nazis and types of fascism, we always like to think, well, you know, if I lived in Germany in the 1930s, you know, I would have been there, you know, right beside Dietrich Bonhoeffer the whole time, you know, on his team. You know, I, I would never have been suckered or seduced by the propaganda and the rhetoric of Hitler and the Nazis. Uh, but you, you have to understand that uh, the, the, the German Nazi party was an incredibly, an incredibly seductive proposal, which is precisely why it was so uh, successful. It, 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 propo it proposed and promised an immediate fixed parliamentary gridlock. It led to an end of economic chaos. It refused to bow down to the crushing indemnities and humiliating conditions of the, of the First World War. And Nazism was not an alien political doctrine that appeared out of nowhere. Nazism succeeded because it embodied what many people already believed or wanted to believe. And Nazism had something for everyone. It was an incredibly eclectic Worldview. You had Darwinian science, even pseudosciences like eugenics. You had aspects of Lutheranism, the philosophy of Nietzsche, the music of, of Wagner, Nordic mythology, anti-Jewish conspiracy theories, idealized versions of masculinity, nationalism, militarism, anti-communism, even a belief in the magical power of ancient artifacts, as we learn from Raiders of the Lost Ark. I mean, it had something for everyone. Nazism appeared to be, you know, scientific, spiritual, progressive, and effective. The new type of civilization that the world needed. And, and if you particularly consider that the, uh, that the German army uh, under the Nazis did in about eight weeks what the, uh, older, pro uh, the older German um, uh, uh, under the previous administration could not do in four years, which is defeat France... It sounded like this unbeatable force. This was the new way of constructing a human civilization. And it was also internally consistent. And it made sense to a lot of people, which is why it drew a lot of support, not just from within, from in, within Germany, but indeed it had sympathizers throughout Europe, throughout um, the whole world, in, in Britain and even the United States. On the other side of the ledger, we have communism. Uh, communists, for all their calls for justice, equality, and tolerance, somehow it always seems to end with guns and gulags. For all their cry of equality, uh, some people always end up being more equal than others. And that's why I think we should always retain uh, and learn from George Orwell's critiques of communism in his classic works like Animal Farm and 1984. And communism is always tethered to Trinity. And I don't know about you, but I have friends uh, who grew up either in the Soviet Union or they lived in the communist countries in Eastern Europe. And while there may be a few aspects of it that were good, like free, free childcare, free university education, no one really remembers the greatness of it. No one really opines for it. Like, oh, I remember the good old days and the bread lines, you know, having a chat or, you know, waiting six, six to 16 years to get a new car or things like that. Um, or even, you know, the, the good old visits from the secret police in the middle of the night to take your wife away. Um, you know, none of my friends from Eastern Europe really look back and say, I wish it was like the good old days under the communist regime. Uh, ordinarily, they regard it with dread, loathing, and even a fair share of trauma. And, you know, we, we should be vigilant against anyone who wants to move in that kind of direction. And I think we should also consider the testimony of Christian leaders who grew up under military and Marxist dictatorships. I mean, the obvious examples we can think of are people like Martin, Martin Niemöller and Dietrich Bonhoeffer in Nazi Germany. Or we could consider more recent examples, like Bishop Oscar Romero in El Salvador, who was assassinated by a right-wing death squad in the 1980s. Uh, maybe some of you have read a classic works like Richard Wormbrand's Tortured for Christ. Anyone, anyone here read that or at least heard of it? Uh, if you haven't read it, I strongly suggest you do. It is a classic work about the persecution of Christians in, uh, in Eastern Europe. 
Uh, more recently, one of the great books I've read is by Chinese pastor Wang Yi, who has forged his own theology of church-state relationships in the context of communist China. And, I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's one thing to think about church and state relationships when the, the biggest issues before you are, you know, Donald Trump or Roe v. Wade or Justin Trudeau's view of, you know, religious freedom vis-a-vis -vis LGBTI rights. I mean, that's one set of issues. But it's another thing to think about church and state relationships when your pastor has been arrested by the police and he's not even able to see a defense attorney. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a different degree of hostility you have from the state. And this is something that Pastor Wang Yi said to one of his police interrogators. This is, this is, uh, th this is such of his fortitude and bravery. He says, I am telling you about a power that will last forever, but this power does not demand land, swords, or all the authority in this day. On the contrary, it is willing to humble itself and submit to the swords and authorities on earth. If you want to use earthly power today to oppress the eternal power, this scripture has already, already revealed the end result. History is Christ written large, not Xi Jinping written large. Um, now, that is what we would call a... Uh, to say that to your police interrogators is what in the military we would call an act of testicular fortitude. Uh, it, takes, it, takes a lot of, it takes a lot of chuzpah uh, to say that to your interrogators. And that's why we should remember, learn from, commemorate Christian leaders across the world against both fascists and communists or dictatorships of all kinds. The, the Christian men and women who have stood up to them and says, Jesus is Lord. You're just a parody. You're just a puppet of a diabolical power in this world. And one day you will get what you deserve. We should remember those leaders. But what about the issues that we're facing uh, today? Uh, particularly in the, in the Christian West. I want to suggest uh, we are facing a similar seduction, the danger of Christian nationalism. And then on the more uh, left-wing side, we have the danger of a soft, progressive authoritarianism. Now, I will contend that Christian nationalism is a danger to, to Christians and non-Christians alike. Now, it, it very much depends what you mean by Christian nationalism. Okay, The belief that Christians should be involved in politics, I do not think that is Christian nationalism. You know, William Wilberforce was a Christian in politics, and he had a great influence. Uh, the idea that we can remember and celebrate the Christian heritage of our country or the contribution to Christian values to our liberal democracy, that is not Christian nationalism. When I refer to Christian nationalism, I'm talking about the view that Christianity must be be hegemonic. We must have Christians in charge and Christians must not be promoting their values, they must be legislating their values even if it goes against the consent of those governed. And look, I mean there's all sorts of things we could also go into for for instance, you know, that the Church of Sweden and the Church of England kind of have established churches. Uh, do we consider them a type of Christian nationalism? Uh, well, to a degree, they do have a much closer relationship with the state than what you find in other jurisdictions in the world. But, but even that, I don't think they necessarily go in the direction of a pernicious Christian nationalism. They can still be part of tolerant and inclusive liberal democracies with their own varieties of secularism. But when we come to the topic of Christian nationalism, we only have to look south of the border to see some of the problems it can lead to. We can see the messianizing of leaders to prop an imagined Christian country or Christian empire. And that can have dire consequences for social freedoms and even prove injurious to the integrity of the church's own witness. The danger is Christianity becomes not simply an ethic, for which we engage in politics, Christianity simply becomes a prop for politics. As if the real religion is politics and Christianity is just one leg in the stool or one ingredient that goes into this uh, particular politically partisan cake that people are making. And we should always, re we should always be very concerned about someone who claims both political authority 
and the summit of religious authority. Someone who claims to be both a uh, high priest, in effect, of Christians and the king. In fact, the Bible has a very special word for someone who tries to combine the offices of king and high priest. And that technical word is antichrist. Someone who wants to be both, if you like, pope and president at the same time, uh, that's never a very good combination, certainly not in the ancient world nor in the present. Christian nationalism of the type we're describing uh, is often based on the idea that unless Christianity is hegemonic and has complete control or, or can curate society along its own lines, then Christians will end up being on the receiving end of persecution. And, and that's not uh, simply true. And it also results in many political leaders merely feigning or pretending to be religious to win favor with their constituents. And then Christianity can even be used to justify unchristian policies and actions related to wars, immigration, income inequality, um, health care, and a myriad of other issues. And it always helps to remember that even the devil can quote scripture and try to rub it into the face of Jesus. But there's one other problem with Christian nationalism. And for me, it's a fairly obvious one. Which type of Christianity should be in charge? Uh, I have to say, I've always found it a little bit comical that some of my, uh, my, my, some of my Baptist friends south of the border seem to be the biggest enthusiasts for some version of Christian nationalism. And that's because the Baptist tradition, dare I say the genius of the Baptist tradition, has always been uh, that it's advocated for the separation of church and state. In order to preserve the freedom and autonomy of Baptist churches, from interference, certainly by the state, a Baptist, going back to the Anabaptists and the English Baptists, both wings of the, of the Baptist tradition, have always championed uh, the separation of church and state because they don't want a pope, prime minister, or king telling them how to do their religion. And, 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 and this is, I think this is fairly obvious. So if you say, look, we want to, we want to be a Christian nation, we want to be, uh, have a Christian nationalist leader in charge, the problem is, well, which version of Christianity would you like to put in charge? Now, let's just say that you elected me Prime Minister of Canada. And let's say I got drunk with power, as I probably would do. You know, actually, if I was, if I was ever elected to public office, you know, do you know, do you know the, my rule would be truly biblical. Do you, know, do you know what would be the verse governing my term in office? It would be Luke 19.27. That would be the verse that would typify my reign as leader. Do you know what Luke 19.27 says? As for those who did not want me to rule over them, bring them before me and slaughter them. <laughs> Dictators get things done. And the first thing I would do when I was mad and drunk with power, as a good Anglican... I would go into the creches of all the Baptist churches and I would baptize your babies. <laughs> you would only be allowed to worship according to the Book of Common Prayer. No more of these, no more of this popular, you know, song things, you know, Jesus, you're terrific for you, I'd swim the Pacific. No. From now on, the 1662 Book of Common Prayer will be the only way you will worship and you will love it. Christian nationalism, the Anglican way. Which, by and by, is what the Baptists largely fled from. Uh, so and that, that's why we don't want Christian nationalism, because you don't want a red-head Australian Anglican lunatic, Exhibit A, um, telling you how to worship, how to run your churches, who you can baptize, who's qualified to be an officer in your church. So th th that's the problem with Christian nationalism. Which type of Christianity should be in charge? And this is where I think we can uh, really appreciate uh, the Baptist tradition because they've understood the value of the separation of church and state because they believe that the church does better when it doesn't have imperial sponsorship and it doesn't have the church intervening in its own life, either to prop it up or to tear it down. And this is something that, that John Locke said. He said, remember, a government 
that can enforce orthodoxy, you know, by the sword, also has the power to enforce heterodoxy by the sword. So always be very careful what you wish for. And we've also, I mean, and, and that is to say, Christian nationalism is a deadly seduction because it represents a a shortcut to political influence. Instead of winning the hearts and minds of people, you just have to win over the donors, the influencers, those who are in the seats of power. And it leads, I think, to a very superficial Christianity, being Christian just at a a, a cultural level without real real conversion, real commitment to Christ. And in the country where there is a superficial, superficial Christianity, uh, that there is always the danger that mission will suffer because everyone's got a, just enough of Christianity to be inoculated against the real thing. And that is why I don't think Christian nationalism is something we should be embracing. Rather, it's something we should be critical of. And there's great resources, I believe, in the Baptist tradition for doing that. So if that's the, the right-wing danger I think we are facing together, what about the mirror image? What on the left side of things? Well, one danger is a type of uh, progressive authoritarianism. I have in mind here uh, what happens when a state seeks to regulate as much as a, of an individual's beliefs, convictions, conscience, and religion as possible. A system of government where non-state-centered forms of life are corroded by constant surveillance and deliberate overregulation. Now, what can alert us to this is a number of things. First of all, um, you can end up with a moral hierarchy of identities. I think that's one of the problems we're, we're facing. Instead of treating everyone with yeah, equality before the law, there is the danger that identities are being treated kind of like a card game, where one identity always trumps another. Uh, there's also the danger that... Uh, all ethical issues or all problems are being treated by dividing everyone into the categories of oppressor or the oppressed. And thirdly, and I think this is important, in, in the sort of progressive type of politics, the state is no longer conceived as an instrumental agent of good, but as an ultimate agent of power with jurisdiction to be extended over every aspect of a person's life, where you get a complete renovation of society according to the state's objectives. In other words, what we are concerned here with is a progressive post-liberal order that does not value the right to dissent, does not value ideological diversity, accept the necessity of public debate, and does not tolerate religions or perspectives that it cannot dictate to a political settlement where the state regards freedoms as permissible to the extent that they accord with the ever-evolving wave of political progressivism. Now, I fear a progressive political state that is just as much as concerned with political blasphemies as much as with social housing, which is concerned with policing wrong think as much as building wind farms, or championing ethnic and sexual diversity while eliminating, on purpose, ideological diversity. Now, I think this is a, a real challenge we're facing in a, a lot of countries. Let me, let me give you one really good example of this. Prior to the uh, war in Ukraine, uh, Russia, I believe, arrested about 300 people uh, on the basis of things they said on the Internet. Okay? About 300 people were arrested in Russia or charged, or, or things like that, for things they said in, 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 uh, on the internet, on social media. During the same time, in the United Kingdom, 3,000 people were arrested, charged, or warned for things they had said on social media. Uh, th that is the, the, the type of soft authoritarianism that I am warning about. And I believe uh, Western democracies uh, are in danger of turning to what I will call a bobocracy. Okay? By that, I mean the rule by the bohemian bourgeois, to use a term from um, David Brooks. I'm talking about people um, who have very progressive values, very um, 
everything's often about the environment, and uh, they like tattoos and cannabis-flavored tofu. Okay, uh, but they're very much in the influence professions and in the uh, upper levels of the bureaucracy. These bobos, you know, the bohemian bourgeois, are a group of mostly white, rich, upper-middle-class elites in politics, media, and influencer professions with niche progressive values, who often exhibit deep resentment to the working class or to rural people, despise them for their pastimes, pieties, and their, uh, their penchant for populist rather than paternal leaders. The danger posed by these you know, bobos is more than big government or you know, empty virtue signaling. It is a government consciously committed to a radical socio-political project of attempting to redefine what it means to be a human being and the relationship of citizens to the states. Uh, many political progressives see Christianity as the number one enemy against which they are struggling. As such, Christian communities, institutions, and cultural influence and moral vision is the darkness against which their post-enlightenment uh, crusade is intended to shine. Christianity's influence then can only be eliminated by realigning institutions towards a more secularized morality, by narrowing the parameters of religious freedom, and by a coercive catharsis of religion itself, and by deconstructing the resident fictions of history, law, and even biology. In the end, the progressive political vision amounts to what the American political philosopher Stephen Macedo calls civic totalism. Now, I want you to remember that phrase because I think that sums up um, the soft authoritarianism of a number of uh, left-wing governments in the Western world. Now, in civic totalism, the state is meant to be invested with all power and seeks to regulate as much of public and private life as possible. Uh, consequently, religion within civic totalism is regarded as somewhat dangerous or unstable because religion ascribes notions of ultimacy to something other than the state and the state's vision for the public good. Uh, now, you, you could note historically that tyrants like Herod, Nero, or any contemporary example always fly into fits of rage when they find out that there is another king to whom people are paying homage. Similarly, for civic totalists, the danger of religion is that it creates a competing social vision and an alternative morality, which divides the loyalty of citizens away from the state's objectives for human conduct, rendering certain forms of religion as hostiles to the state's ambition. In civic totalism, religion is permitted, but it is either a state-approved religion, or more to the point, politics is the religion. Let me tell you this, in a godless age, there will still be gods. But people's religious entity and their worshipping proclivities will be translated into the political realm. Civic totalists are irreligious only for the reason that they have found new outlets for religious devotion. A devotion which is directed towards them. And it's a devotion that sometimes requires mandatory participation. As such, in civic totalism, the ruling regime must be defended by, says Macedo, a shared account of basic civic, civic values that imposes limits and what can be true in the religious sphere. This is why the German philosopher Jürgen Habermas contended that the consciousness of the faithful must be modernized and forced to acquiesce and accept the individualistic and egalitarian nature of the laws of the secular community. In other words, the government has to boss about religious communities and tell them what they can and cannot believe. This is not merely religion within the limits of reason. It's religion within the limits of the progressive vision. Now, the, the totalist ambition of the uh, of this bohemian, bo uh, bohemian, let me say it again, bohemian regime, let's call it that, uh, it, it's, it's, this is not directly as confrontational or intrusive as fascism or communism. But when you have an elite class who have an inability to accept notions of difference and dissent, combined with anxieties over the perceived disloyalties of the working class, 
And then there's an antipathy towards people of faith and a desperate need to silence critics. That does lend itself to a soft authoritarianism that could potentially morph into something potentially Orwellian. Civic totalists want to subordinate the nation, family, religion, and individuals to their ideology. And in defiant response, uh, the church must advocate for its own freedom of worship, its witness, and stand for the liberties of others as well, including other religious communities. Uh, Laura Alexander says something here that I think is quite right. She says, The purpose of the state is to promote human well-being by providing order, protection, and material and social goods that allow people to live reasonably stable lives and pursue good and meaningful ends. Fair enough. But then she adds something, a very important caveat. She says, the state is not itself an ultimate end to be pursued or an ultimate authority that merits people's highest loyalty. States' promotion of their interests and their use of sovereign power remain subject to, to, to critique from a higher moral plane. And those who acclaim Jesus as king will always be suspicious of a state or class that claims to be mediators of ultimacy. Christians just need to stand up against any group that threatens the civil liberties of their own or others, whether that's lesbians, Muslims, or um, even gothic vegans. They're a, they're, they're a very despised minority, the gothic vegans. You know, someone really needs to stand up for them. Okay. Look, every church around the world, whether you're in Nigeria, Nicaragua, or even in New Brunswick, uh, we have to adjust, address the problems that confront us, injustice, oppression, tyranny, and seek our own way of being a city on a hill. Now, that is not to reduce the church to some kind of political action committee or uh, simply the cause of a, of a um, social gospel or even align it with a political faction. But it's to affirm what we all know is intuit intuitively true, that our evangelical convictions about God putting the world to rights are only as strong as the evils we tolerate. So whether we are resisting racism, illegal land seizures, a government controlled by uh, ga gambling lobbyists, that's the situation in Australia, corruption and censorship, we must ask whether the governing bodies deserve our obedience, our dissent, our civil disobedience, or even our uncivil disobedience. This is no academic question, but th this could be very much an in-your-face question that you may have to confront in different places in the world. Um, as I, th I don't know if I hinted this in, in previous lectures, but in Hong Kong right now, there are a number of churches which are divided whether they should join the pro-democracy protest movement, be involved in that, or should they simply you know, withdraw from that conflict, stick to spiritual things, you know, o obey the state in spiritual matters. And this is where um, uh, Hong Kong theologian Kwok Poi Lan has, has, a, has a great comment. She says, uh, Christians have, this is in Hong Kong, Christians organize prayer meetings in public and church spaces and in front of government buildings. Unlike public protests, religious meetings enjoy more protection from interference from police and the organizers do not have to apply for a permit to gather in public. Christians sang hymns, offered prayers for the city and government officials and elective representatives. The Christian hymn, Sing Hallelujah to the Lord, emerged as a unifying anthem during the early stage of the protests, sung by Christians and non-Christians alike. Some churches near the protest routes opened their doors and offered hospitality to protesters. But there were also Christians who believed in separation of church and state and that Christians should obey the authorities. Many evangelical churches did not want to become politically involved and see evangelism as their priority. These divergent opinions have split local churches and denominations in Hong Kong with some members leaving their local churches because of their dissatisfaction with the church's response to the protests. So this discussion of how we might oppose Christian nationalism or civic totalism, this is not an academic question. In some parts of the world, this is a real, in your face, you've got to have an answer to this now, which means Christians have got to think about their own theology of church and state. And what will they do in the mixed, and when faced with a left-wing or right-wing regime 
that starts trampling on human rights, political rights, the rule of law. Uh, I don't think it's that way in Canada uh, right now, uh, or even in Australia. But we're only ever one generation away, or even a, a couple of years away from, from facing that situation. The world can change at very short notice. I mean, I'll never forget when I was, uh, when I was in the military in the, in the, in the mid-90s, the, uh, the, uh, the chief of the army came and visited my battalion. And someone asked, you know, what's the prospect of us ever going into, into, into like a real hot conflict or going to war? And uh, this, this is the mid-90s where like, you know, the, uh, the Cold War was over. Uh, the global war on terrorism was still far away. And uh, he said, look, there's no chance. Now, the world's pretty much at peace, you know. The most dangerous thing you're probably going to face will be a refugee holding a very sharp piece of pineapple. <laughs> he saw no prospect for it. And that was, that was in 1995. Four years later, the entire Australian army was deployed to East Timor on peacekeeping operations there. Then you had 9-11, global war on terrorism, Iraq, and then, you know, over 20 years in Afghanistan. The world can change politically, militarily, economically at very short notice. And in that time, you're going to have to discern within the precincts of your own conscience, what are you going to do? What does it mean to be a faithful Christian you know, in the face of a Christian nationalist government or a civic totalist government or a military dictatorship or something like that? And when that happens, we need to pray for the grace and wisdom to do what is right by God and what is right by our fellow Christians. And on that note, I think I will end. Thank you. All right. So some of you are back here in the back. I want to make sure you get an opportunity to. And Ben? Yeah, I had a quick question. You said something along the lines of how the high priest and the king offices should never like, be the same person. So I just want to ask a quick question about how you would see the order of Melchizedek or how Melchizedek acts in the Bible, both in Genesis and in Hebrews, just general thoughts on him. Well, no, I would, I would say Jesus is the one place where they are combined because he is the king and the great high priest. And that's why anyone who claims to have both political and religious authority is claiming uniquely what is Christ and Christ alone, which makes them then the Antichrist. Okay. Someone else? Right here? No? No. <laughs> uh, you've got the, the two sides that you see there of Christian nationalism or separation of church and state. Do we have any historical examples of what we might think of as a third way where there can be a relationship between the church and the government and yet not have it stray into a Christian nationalist situation? Yeah, I can. If you, if you look at the, um, like the United Kingdom, um, you know, the, the, the king is technically the head of, the, of England and the whole Commonwealth and is also technically supreme governor of the Church of England, which does kind of start moving that antichrist direction I was kind of warning out. About and after remember in the United in the United Kingdom, um, bishops and key positions are appointed by the crown. Uh, so you, you you do have a kind of established church and a, a a very close relationship between church and state in the United Kingdom, albeit uh, with a certain degree of secularity at the same time. But just just consider this at the moment, even with a an established church. Okay, at the moment in the UK, you have a Christian king a Hindu prime minister, an atheist opposition leader, a Buddhist home secretary, and a Muslim first minister of Scotland. So even with an established church, you still have a pluralistic and participationist liberal democracy. Uh, so I, I, but I think that's because of the unique heritage of the United Kingdom it, it, itself. So Maybe that's the exception that proves the rule, but I think there are instances where you can have Christianity somewhat uh, I embedded or operating closely to the state, and it doesn't have to end up in Christian nationalism. So, yeah, I mean, th there are some examples. I would say even if you have a separation of church and state, there are degrees of separation. So I, I don't know about, about Canada, but we have, uh, 
we have Christian chaplains in the Australian military. You know, we have chaplains in state-funded hospitals. Uh, also, a lot of charities like the Salvation Army or World Vision often receives federal grants. Okay? So there, there are di different levels of separation between church and state. And I think church and state can sometimes work together for the common good. Now, for some people, any cooperation or any relationship between church and state is simply anathema, if you like. Uh, I'm, I'm less skeptical of that. I, I, I think um, church and state can work together for the common good, albeit there are, there are risks and seductions. Uh, certainly in the Australian school system, where 15% of um, kids are in a Christian school, uh, those Christian schools are still partially federally funded. Not completely, but partially f fed federally funded. And you know the old saying, he who pays the piper calls the tune? Uh, that is currently one of the issues we're facing in Australia. Yeah. No wind? No wind? Huh? Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, this is about uh, Christian nationalism once again, and it seemed to me that your chief argument against it was just a practical problem of who in the world is actually going to run this thing, what kind of Christian, well, Anglican or Baptist or whatnot. Um, my understanding is that the standard Christian nationalist response is to accept that practical problem, but to say we'd much rather have you know an Australian Anglican running the show then what will really be the only other alternative, which is, as you called it, the bobocracy. Yeah. That there's not oh, going to be I don't a know. Once, once you've been under my lash, <laughs> maybe once maybe. you've been under the lash of Mike, I reckon yeah. Justin Trudeau will start <laughs> to look pretty good. Yeah. I think, you know. Um, well, yeah, I did say that was the practical problem, but I also said um, there is that there is the issue of the corruption of power. Power does corrupt, okay? And it will also lead to a superficial cultural Christianity. And historically, you could say, look, Christians do not need to be in power in order to thrive. The church in Iran is, is growing. Okay? And I can also point out, if you look at other parts of the world, like Christians in India, you don't have Christians in India saying, this nation belongs to God and these Hindus have stolen it for us. We need to make India Christian again. Uh, you, you don't find Christians in India making that argument. Okay. Uh, really what they want is the ability to be left alone uh, uh, from persecution from Hindu nationalists. That's what Christians in India want. So it's, it's somewhat unique to the American or the Western context, mm. the idea that we need to return Christianity to its ascendancy. What we need, uh, I think, are our freedoms, not hegemony. And sometimes we don't know the difference between the two. So let me give you an example of that. In the Australian Parliament, it's still a custom to begin every day saying the Lord's Prayer. So whenever the Parliament meets, they say the Lord's Prayer. Now at one level, you know, I, I think praying the Lord's Prayer is a pretty good idea for everyone. You know, it's a great way. It recognizes our Christian heritage. Since that has forged, uh, those values have forged uh, the liberal democracy that we enjoy. But to be perfectly honest, you could say there is a danger that it leads to a nominal Christianity or it suggests that Christianity should be hegemonic and privileged. Uh, for that reason, I, I think I would be in favour of beginning uh, the Parliament, as, as some have suggested, not with the Lord's Prayer, but simply a few brief moments for silent reflection and prayer. Because that, that way it's, it's not casting Christianity as the default religion in, in the parliament and in the country because at the end of the day the parliament is there to represent all citizens it is the parliament for people of all faiths and none hello um, so we tend to to see two pictures in the old testament in related to politics uh, joseph in a empire egypt empire and the uh, Daniel in the Babylon. Uh, both of them, they never started a political career. Uh, they just were there uh, by the Lord, were put there by the Lord. And even Daniel, uh, his civil disobedience was almost going to cost his life, and he was saved by, by God. 
And on the other hand, on the New Testament, we have Jesus, uh, who was the king, who is the king, and he had everything to, to, to get on the top of the empire of that time, and he decided not to do and to stay on, on the line. And on the other hand, we have Paul. Uh, of course, I am not putting him on the same uh, level as Jesus, but he had everything to be even governor of Judea since he was a, a Pharisee and a Roman. So in, in, in both sides, we have politics who were not being intentional of being polit uh, in the politic uh, stage. And on the other hand, we have two other people who decided to die uh, due to the injustice of the government. So today, we as, as Christians, sometimes we want to follow an Old Testament figure, but we as New Testament persons who are part of the New Covenant, we need to preach, we need to share the gospel, we need to be intentional on the kingdom, not as uh, Daniel and Joseph, that they didn't do a biblical group on, their, uh, on the Senate or something like that. So for us, it's kind of difficult, and my question would be, where are we? On the non-intentional, but uh, favored by the Lord, or behind the line and just working for the kingdom and accepting the fact that Jesus died, Paul died, and even Bonhoeffer at the end, he died uh, on, in, on the Nazi stage. Yeah. Where, where are we? Where should we be? Uh, well, it's, it's, where sh it's where should we be uh, is where the Lord has put us. Uh, and it, it, there's a difference for being a Christian in Iran, in Ukraine, in Nigeria, or Canada. And you're going to face different challenges. So sometimes, like I said, I said yesterday, sometimes, it, it, like Romans 13, submit to governing authorities, and that's fine. But other times it's Revelation 13. You've got to pray that God brings this whole totalitarian beast crumbling down. Uh, sometimes we're called to, be, to play the role of Joseph. Um, other times we're called uh, to play the role of, of Daniel. Sometimes we are, we are called to play the, these, you know, these different roles. Uh, if you like, sometimes we're called to play the role of Esther. Um, or sometimes, you know, that, that's your, or John the Baptist. Uh, it's always going to depend upon your context. I can't say there's one biblical example we should follow. It's always based on the context that you're in. Time for maybe one or two more. Now we'll go to the front. Hi, thank you for everything you've brought for us so far. Um, I am a big believer in the freedom of others to live their lives the way they want to because I want to enjoy those freedoms. Um, to live out my faith yeah. for myself and my family. Um, but where would you, and I realize this is getting quite philosophical, where do you draw the lines if they're not religious and they're not from the government? In North American history, we have, um, we can find cases of, of people killing because they were, they were working out their religious beliefs. Yep. Um, I don't want that level of freedom. Mm. <laughs> so, so how do we express that? How do we say that we want freedom for others to a point? Because the point is always drawn in my reality. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Norman, and this is, I mean, you'll be glad to know you're not the first person who's wrestled with this. Uh, and certainly when it comes to religion and law, you have the same issue. So normally it comes down to what is the degree of detriment that the expression of your religion may potentially burden others with. So let, let me give you two examples. Let me use a famous one from Denver. There was that um, Jack Phillips, that famous cake decorator, who was asked to decorate a cake for a, for a same-sex couple. And he refused on the grounds of freedom of conscience. And he won his, um, his case before SCOTUS for a number of reasons for a start. Uh, one of the uh, Denver Human Rights Commissioners basically accused him of being a Nazi or being worse than the Nazis, which shows that there was a level of discrimination and prejudice at the Denver level. But he also had a, a, a very good claim. He said, look, 
I will serve all people without question, gay, black, straight, anything. But I don't do all art requested based on freedom of conscience. And he gave some good examples. He was asked to make some rather macabre Halloween decorations, which he refused. He was asked to make some rather uh, bawdy um, cake decorations for a Bucks party, which he refused. He was also asked to bake a t cake with an um, you know, anti-homosexual message on it, which he refused to do. And he said, this is just freedom of conscience. There's some types of art I just don't want to make. So he didn't discriminate against L LGBT people in decorating a cake for them, like a birthday cake or, a, or anything, but he just, in good conscience, could not decorate a you know, same-sex marriage wedding cake. And that's why he won, partly why he won the, uh, the decision um, at the, the, the course. And you could argue as well, like, you know, if cake decorators are not hard to find. You know, so the fact that a cake decorator um, won't decorate your cake, probably sure you can find another one. And even if you can't find another one, no one's going to die over it, okay? So the, the degree of detriment there is pretty small. But imagine you've got a heart surgeon who's a Sunni Muslim who refuses to perform um, heart surgery on a Shia Muslim. Okay, or something like, or, or some analogy like that. You could argue that the discrimination there is pretty big because it's a life-saving operation. Okay, so it always comes down to the degree of detriment that you are burdening other people with. Um, wanting to engage in child sacrifice, yeah, I think it's a pretty high degree of detriment. And but for the most part, you know, it 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 comes it comes down to. Um, managing differences within, within equality. Saying, look, within a multicultural, multi-faith world, we're going to have different views, different values. What is the best way for accommodating them and making sure that some groups, particularly minorities, are not unfavorably treated or discriminated at? Now, liberal democracy very much works on the idea that we all have basic freedoms, and those freedoms should be maximized without being to each other's detriment. And, and that's, uh, that's why we have things like equality before the law. This is why we have constitutions. The purpose of, um, you know, we, we are not a, 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 a democracy of the mob. We are a constitutional democracy, and constitutions protect minorities from the majority. That, that's their purpose. So, you know, in, in, the, in the same way, we should be going for equality before the law rather than using other mechanisms to solve these debates, like a hierarchy of identities. I don't think that's a good way to solve those sorts of differences. If we have a good um, constitutional framework, good anti-discrimination bills, and which, a, uh, which are fair, and no one is, uh, is burdened with someone else's conscience or religion, generally you can move forward on that. Now, there can be a little bit of argy-bargy, as we would say, in Australia. And, I mean, the epicenter of that is, like, you know, between Christians and their views of family marriage and sexuality and, say, the LGBT community. So, for example, can you sack your employee in a secular, if you're in a secular business, can you sack, sack one of your employees for being gay or bisexual? Now, I think we would generally say no, I mean, because that means you're wrongly burdening them. But on the other hand, can you force a Muslim high school to, to um, hire a gay atheist because you think the Muslims there need to be taught some diversity lessons? I'd argue that's a little bit you know, you know, heavy-handed. Okay? So, I mean, th th those are the sorts of issues that, we're, that they're wrestling with in many jurisdictions. But, yeah, you're right. Um, religious freedom is good, but, but what are the limits on the freedoms that we allow? Let's show our appreciation for Dr. Bird once more. <clears throat>